as you rise from your knees. Let's open our Bibles. And let's turn to the book of John chapter 14. A little humming. John chapter 14. Where are we going to? John the 14th chapter. Let's take a look at verse number 6 of John chapter 14. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ we come. Feed us with bread from heaven's bakery. Bread that you have placed upon your table. There's something in this message for each person here and also those online, Safe to Serve International. Be with us now, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. John 14 and verse number 6. Are we there? Read this with me. What it says here? Jesus saith unto him. What did he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by but by me. And where is this way found? Based on Psalm 77, verse 13, in the sanctuary. Let's quote that. Psalm 77, verse 13. Thy way, O Lord, is where? It's in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Look with me. Exodus chapter 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Exodus 25, and that way can be found in the sanctuary, Psalm 77 and verse 13. And here we are now in Exodus 25 and verse number 8. And what did God say to Moses? Verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Verse 9, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. And what is that thing that separates us from God? It's sin. So in the sanctuary, God is showing us how he wants to remove sin from us sinners and save us. And what was laid out in the tabernacle, the sanctuary, the daily ritual, the daily rites, the daily services... God was showing us through this object lesson how, how he wants to make us perfect in his character. What was done in the sanctuary, the temple, is what God wants to do in us. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and verse 20, the Bible says, Know you not that your bodies are what? Your bodies, if you know it, finish it. That your bodies are whose temple? Your bodies are are the temples of the Holy Ghost. That's it. So what God did in the earth sanctuary is what he wants to do where? In us. And of course, a secondary application, what he wants to do in the church where people gather to receive his word. Now look with me, Exodus chapter 40. So what we want to do is to study in part, in short, the sanctuary message. And we want to see a specific event that transpired there and we want to see how that pertains to our salvation look at exodus chapter 40 and here's the point when the sanctuary was completed in its building when moses finished the erection of the sanctuary the bible tells us that the glory of god filled the temple what happened once that sanctuary was finished the glory of god filled the temple now, so what does God want to put in us? The glory of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, verse 28. Bible says uh, this is the mystery of godliness. What is that mystery of godliness? It is Christ in you. Christ in you. Christ in me. The hope of glory which we preach and which we present every man perfect. In Christ. Exodus chapter 40, look with me at verse number 33. The Bible tells us, are we there? It says, and he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. Let's read the next five words. What it says, one sentence, what it says, my friends. So Moses finished the work. Hmm. And once the work of the literal sanctuary was finished, look what happened next in verse 34. Let's read that. Verse 34, then a cloud, then a cloud covered 
the tent of the congregation. And what happened next? And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So what does God want to do in us? Does God want to finish the work of redemption in us? As a matter of fact, just follow me here. Hold your place in Exodus chapter 40. Go to John chapter 4 with me. Where are we going to? John the fourth chapter. Just a quick reference. John chapter 4. And look what God's word says. In John the fourth chapter, I won't go there. But John chapter 4. And look with me at verse number 34. Are you there? It says this, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And what are the next five words? And to finish his work. All right. Go back with me. Exodus 40. So once the work was finished in the literal tabernacle, what happened next? The glory of God Feel that literal temple. That means when the plan of salvation is completed in us, finished in us, when we have laid aside sin forever, what will God fill us with? You got it. The glory of God. Look at verse 34 again. And then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Verse 35. And Moses was not able to enter into uh, the tent of the congregation because the what? The cloud abode thereon, notice now, and the glory of the Lord did what, my friends? Fill the tabernacle. So once the work is completed in us, the Bible is telling us what God did in the literal tabernacle, literal sanctuary, literal temple, is what he wants to do in us. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. And what is that thing? To fill us with his glory, with his character, with his presence. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. Where are we going to? Romans chapter 8. The Bible tells us whom God has called them he justifies and the ones who receive justification pardon forgiveness them he glorifies here are the steps where are we going to romans chapter 8 look with me at verse number 30 romans 8 and verse number 30 it says this moreover whom he predestinate them he also what what's the first step in salvation then he called that's the first step in salvation do we initiate salvation who does that who calls us notice whom he calls them he also called next phrase and whom he called then he also what justified pause right there and what does justified mean it means to be forgiven it means to be pardoned so what is God calling us to do what must we do to be pardoned? What must we do to be forgiven? What must we do to be declared just? Confess our sins. So what is God calling us today, September 8th, to do? To confess our sins. He convicts us of sin and he calls us to confess our sins. And once we confess our sins, which means we respond to the call, what will he then do? justify us and once he justify us pardon forgive us what happens next he says then he glorifies verse 30 whom he called then he also justified and whom he justified then he also what my friends look at the screen right here glorified selected messages book one page 389 the scripture quoted is romans chapter 8 Verse 29, verse 30, we just read that. Blue words from top. It says, calling and justification are not the same thing. Two separate things. Those whom he called, he justified. Calling and justification are not one and the same thing. Friends, you have to understand this. Because here at Safe to Serve, we don't preach works, religion. Watch this. Calling is the drawing of the sinner to Christ. And whose work is that? And it is a work wrought by whom? The Holy Spirit. Upon the heart, convicting of sin. And what now? Inviting the, the person 
to repent. Is Christ sending us his invitation to repent right now? So must you accept and respond to this invitation? Red words, many are confused as to what constitutes the first step in the work of salvation. What is that first step? I'll get there. Repentance is the thought, is thought to be a work the sinner must do for himself in order that he may come to Christ. That's works religion. You can't repent of yourself. They think that the sinner must procure for himself a fitness in order to obtain the blessing of God's grace. But while it is true that repentance must precede forgiveness, for it is only the broken and contrite heart that is acceptable to God. Let's read those, those words. Yes, what, my friends? Yet the sinner cannot underscore that. Yet the sinner cannot bring himself to repentance or prepare himself to come to Christ. Hmm. Except the sinner repent, he cannot be forgiven. But the question to be decided is as to whether repentance is the work of the sinner or what? Or the gift of Christ. Pause, put the scripture down. Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, verse 30, verse 31. Bible says that the father exhorted Christ to be both a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance is also a gift. Would you accept that gift? <laughs> it's a gift. Get back to my screen. It says, except the sinner repent, he cannot be forgiven. But the question to be decided is as to whether repentance is the work of the sinner or what, friends? The gift of Christ. Must the sinner wait until he's filled with remorse for his sin before he can come to Christ? Oh, no. Listen, the very what now? One more time. The very what, friends? The very first step. Mercy, steps to Christ. The very first step to Christ is taken through the drawing, the calling, the inviting of the Spirit of God. As man responds to this drawing, what happens next? He advances toward Christ in order that he may repent. Will you respond to Christ's invitation today? So now when he calls us, and we surrender our sins, will he forgive us? Will he justify us? Will he treat us as if we never sinned? And as we continue in this experience of, 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 of confessing our sins, confession, confessing our sins, that means very, very soon Christ now can glorify us. Christ now can declare us perfect. Christ now can fill us with his uh, power, with his spirit, with his Glory. Look at this statement right here. Selected messages, book one, page 366. It says, but while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through whose merits? Merits of Christ. Watch carefully. No man. How many? No man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins. Hmm. Or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. Notice now, and in order for man to retain justification, there must be what, my friends? Continual obedience through what now? Active, living faith that works by love and Go to John chapter 17 with me. Those whom he has called, them he also justifies. And those who receive justification, they also receive glorification. And this means the work of salvation is finished in us. And God now can fill us with his glory. And this will be a fulfillment of Christ's prayer in John 17. And what was Christ's prayer in John 17? That who would be filled with his glory. That's us. Go to John 17. Are we there, my friends? Verse 22. And the glory, John 17, 22, and the glory which thou gavest, 
me I have given them that they may be even as I in them, verse 23, I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast a, what am I reading? Go back to verse 22. Verse 22, are we there my friends? And the what now? And the glory which thou gavest me I have. Don't read over that my friends. So does God want to fill us with his glory? Skip on down to verse 24. Father, it is prayer. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. For what purpose? That they may behold. Finish that. That they may behold my glory. Pause right there. And by beholding, we become what? Ah. So what must we behold, my friends? The glory of Christ. Was this a prayer of Christ? That we behold his glory? And by beholding his glory, we be changed into his image? I want to ask you a question. When you send up a prayer request to Christ Jesus, do, do you expect him to answer it? So when we read of a prayer of Christ, what does he expect us to do? So here is a prayer we can answer. Here is a prayer of Christ from Jesus that we can answer. What is that prayer? That we behold? That's our choice. Will you behold him today, friends? Will you go to John chapter 1? Where are we going to? John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word, and the what, friends? And the word in the beginning was the word. And the word was? And the word was? Verse 14. And the word, Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld what? That's it, friends. And we beheld his glory. Chapter 18 of the Revelation. And that's why we have such a message. In chapter 18 of the Revelation, verse number 1, the Bible tells us that God's end time people, what will they be filled with? What will they be filled with? They will be filled with the glory of God, which means then the work of salvation has been finished in their lives. Because when Moses completed the work in that tabernacle, the cloud descended. And what happened? The glory of God did fill that temple. And this is what God wants to do for us. Do you want that glory, my friends? Without it, we are lost. With it, we are saved. Do you want it, my friends? And how do we receive this practically? And not me preaching some theory, abstract message. Those whom he called, finish it. He justified. And those whom he justified, finish it. He, oh, you got it. Verse 1, chapter 18, verse 1, Revelation. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. Let's read now. And the what now? And the earth was what? Lightened with his glory. That means the work of salvation is finished in the hearts of these people. Look with me. Habakkuk chapter 2. Where are we going to? Go to Habakkuk, my friends. That's why now we must study in a practical sense how we may receive the glory of God. And the first step, don't miss it. The first step is when God convicts us of our sins, when God convicts us of sin, that is his invitation. Pause right there. Say, somebody's wondering, have I grieved the Spirit of God? Now, I don't know because I don't know what that feels like. Do you know what it feels like? No, I don't know. But one thing is certain. That when you are convicted of sin, you haven't grieved the Spirit of God, my friends. Is that point clear? All right, get back here. Habakkuk chapter 2. Bible tells us. So now, when God calls us, he says, come, surrender, and then he justifies us. Amen? And once we retain justification keep living above sin, then by and by he will fill us with his spirit. He will glorify us. If that's clear, say amen. Habakkuk chapter 2. Now skip on down to verse 14. Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. What it says, my friends, what knowledge do we need in 2018, September 8? What knowledge do we need? Verse 14. You got it. Verse 14. For the earth, for the earth, shall be filled with what? 
with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Did we not just read the fulfillment of this scripture? In chapter 18 of the Revelation, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Habakkuk, go down to, no, I can't spend much time there. Go with me. Second Chronicles, no, come back here. No, 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 don't leave. Come on. Don't leave. It's so sweet, my friends. Don't leave it. Have you ever drank something very nutritious and you were about to put it down and you put it back to your head? Here it is. Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, for the earth shall be filled with the what, friends? The knowledge of the glory of the Lord. What, is, what must we begin to do practically? Go to verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2, and the Lord answered me and, and said, what must we do, friends, so the knowledge of the glory of God may fill us? Write the vision, praise God. It's time to write some articles. What do you say? And as you write the articles on how people may receive knowledge of the glory of God, then we can preach what we write. Come here. And as we preach what we write, then others who hear it and read may also run to evangelize. And so the world individuals may be filled with what? Finish that. Verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may that he may again run that what second chronicles go there with me so we just read second chronicles 7 so we just read in exodus chapter 40 verse 33 through verse 35 when moses had finished making the tabernacle and that tabernacle was was a portal was a mobile was a mobile tabernacle and once the mobile, which means they could break it down and later on re-erect it. Make sense now? So when Moses finished the mobile tabernacle, what filled that place? The glory of God. Now we come to Solomon's temple. When Solomon erected the stationary now, it, it, with brick and mortar and steel and gold and, so, and such like amen when he established the stationary temple the bible says when solomon finished making that temple what happened next the glory of god filled the temple so what we want to do now is to study the prayer of solomon because when solomon made the temple and finished it the glory of god didn't then fill the temple it was after solomon prayed so we want to study Solomon's prayer. Are we together, my friends? And by analyzing, and then we can synthesize that prayer and apply it to our lives and see what God is saying to us, then we can learn in a practical manner how we may be filled with the glory of God. Second Chronicles, chapter 7. Look at verse 1. Bible says, Now when Solomon had made, are we there? Now when Solomon had made an end of, underscore that friend. It's going to be a golden thread this morning here. And when Solomon had made an end of praying, Bible says the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. Let's read now, last phrase, and the glory of the Lord. What my friends, fill the house. So what caused the glory of God to fill the house? Two things. The temple was finished and Solomon, something is in that prayer for us. Do you want to see it, my friends? So go back now to 2 Chronicles 6. Put down the scripture. 1 Corinthians, yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15 says, If we are going to sing, we must sing with the Spirit and sing with the understanding also. And then it says, if we're going to pray, we must pray with the Spirit and pray with the, finish it, and pray with the understanding also. So as we read Solomon's prayer, make it your prayer. What do you say, friends? Amen. And that's how we study God's word. Hear me now, hear me. Just a nugget here, hear me. When you're having a personal devotion and you're taking God's word scene by scene, if you read a prayer, in that scene, then make that prayer your prayer to God. Does it make sense? Yes. If you read a, an instruction 
in that scene for your personal devotion, then ask God for strength and consistency to do what the instruction says because God is talking to you personally. Does it make sense? That's how we have devotion. If you read a promise, you say, dear God, help me to believe this promise when? Today. And claim this promise when? Today. And even if I don't see the promise fulfilled today, help me still to believe it when? Today. This is personal devotion. Come back here now. Second Chronicles chapter 6, are we there? Look at verse 14. Bible says, this is a prayer. And said, we must make this our prayer. And said, O Lord, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven, nor in the earth, which keepest covenant, underscore covenant, which keepest covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Do, now let me help you here. Let's really have devotion on the Sabbath afternoon right here do you see a condition in that verse that we must meet before we can receive God's mercy what is that condition we have to keep the covenant so what is the covenant the Ten Commandments it's right there in verse in verse 11 it's in verse 11 now come back here it's also in chapter 5 verse 7 Verse 10, all right, so what is the condition to keep his covenant? Now, can we in our own strength obey God's Ten Commandments? So since he says this is the condition to receive my mercy, to be filled with my glory, keep my covenant, then how are we going to respond to him? Again, if you read an instruction, what must you respond to God and say? Give me the strength. To keep it, this is how you have a conversation with God. And you speak just above a whisper, not in your mind. And then your mind, be your thoughts begin to stray. No, you speak out just above a whisper. But there is another condition in the last phrase of verse 14. What is the next condition? That walk before thee with all their hearts. Is that not a condition? And since it is a condition, it's also an instruction. How are you going to respond to him today, friends? You see, as you learn to have devotion, devotion, communion with God is not a one-way street where you simply just talk to God. And that's where many times we leave our time of communion, prayer and devotion, and we feel weak just as when we went into the prayer closet. Why? We didn't have a dialogue. You must have a dialogue. So when you read an instruction, talk back to him. Lord, here is where I am struggling. I'm not walking with all my heart in your ways, but give me strength from this day forward to honor your commandments. Will he honor his word? Come back here. So what is the promise in verse 14? Come on. Be like children searching in God's word for treasures. Verse 14. What is that, friends? Oh, let me give you a quote. Great controversy, page 522. No church can excel in holiness except its members are daily seeking for knowledge, for wisdom, for truth, as for hidden treasures. GC 522, book that. Come back here. What is the promise in verse 14? If we keep his covenant and walk before him with all our hearts. What is the promise? He's going to give us mercy. Question, is there also a condition to receive his mercy? Put beside verse 14, Proverbs 28 and verse 13. And what says Proverbs 28 verse 13? Bible says, my friends, if we covereth, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But the one who confesses, and forsakes his sin, what will he have and find and receive? He shall receive God's mercy. So then we must say, Lord, give me strength to confess. The first step in salvation is he calling us to confess, my friends. Do you believe it? And notice when Solomon prayed that part of the prayer, what happened 
42 verses afterward. What came down? The glory of God filled the temple. So when we pray this prayer, even that verse, with the understanding, sincerely, what must we await now, my friends? The glory of God to fill our hearts. Do you believe it? If so, say amen, because your face is telling me a different story. Do you believe it? Come on down to verse 16. A second part of the prayer is in verse 16. And this part of the prayer, it's talking about how God promised his children that they can sit on his throne. On his what, friends? Do you want to sit there? Verse 16. Now, therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him. What was the promise? There shall not fail thee a man in my side to sit upon, underscore this last phrase now, to sit upon the throne of Israel. Yet, so that thy children take heed to their way to walk in my law as thou hast walked before me. Now then, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be what, my friends? I want to ask you a question right here. So what was the promise in verse 16? Let's have devotion now because this is where many people struggle. What is the promise in verse 16? As long as God exists, somebody is going to sit upon my throne. Now, of course, contextually, it's talking about the literal uh, people of Israel. There will be a king there, right? But for our application, which throne would Christ promise us to sit on? His father's throne. So what scripture comes to mind now? Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. Now, is there a condition there in verse 21? To him that overcometh will I grant, it's a gift, to sit with me in my father's throne as I also overcame and I'm set down with my father in his throne. So what is the condition to receive this promise? You're not talking to me. We have to overcome. So how would you respond then? Because you see the promise, but you see a condition. <laughs> Talk to me, friends. How would you then respond? Lord, give me. Give me. That's it. And what's in verse 20 of chapter 3 of the Revelation? Another condition. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open that door, I will and will and he with. Oh, my friends. So what is the condition then for you and me to sit on his throne? So how are you going to respond today, my friends? Lord, here am I, weak, a failure. But today I want to sit with you in your throne. Give me power to overcome. Volume 1, Testimonies, page 143, I saw that many have so much rubbish piled up at the doors of their hearts. Some have difficulties between themselves and their brethren to remove. Others have evil tempers, selfish covetousness to remove before they can get the door open. Others have rolled the world before the doors of their hearts, which bars the door. All this rubbish must be taken away so the door can be opened to welcome the Savior in. So what's barring him from coming in, friends? What do we have behind the door? Rubbish. And what is called rubbish? Evil tempers, selfishness, covetousness. Is God saying, no, examine your heart now, friends? Animosity, grudge and jealousy between you and that person. Hatred, malice unforgiveness you got to remove that stuff friends so what will you say to god right now come on down here verse number amen you got it we're having devotion verse 19 it says now and verse 19 is a third part in the prayer and in verse 19 god promised to put his name in that temple now i want to ask you a question where does god really want to put his name in a building on the wall 
Come here, verse 19. Have res- he's still praying. Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee. Verse 20, everybody, let's read now. That thine eyes may be open upon this house. How often? Day and night upon the place whereof thou hast said that thou wouldest do what, my friends? Put thy name there. Contextually, it's talking about a building. But remember, the building was always an object lesson to what God wants to do here in this tabernacle, in this body temple, in this sanctuary, the body. And where does God want to put his name? On our foot? In our fingers. We are my friends. And what text comes to mind now? Revelation 14 verse 1. And after these things I saw how many? I saw the Lamb. He stood upon Mount Zion. And with him how many? A hundred and forty and four thousand. Having the Father's name written in their hearts. Oh my friends. Is that a promise? And notice, 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 is there a condition to have that promise fulfilled? God's name is in your forehead. What is that promise? It's in chapter 14 of the Revelation. Put down verse 4 now and verse 5. The Bible says, those who will receive the Father's name, his character. Now, is character glory? Is character glory? Yes, those who receive God's glory, Bible says they must follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. So is that not a condition? And as a condition, is that not an instruction? So how would you respond today to God? To be filled with his glory, you must follow him whithersoever he goes. How would you respond to him now? I'm not hearing you. Now what song would you turn to in your hymnal now? About following him. About following him. Come on. I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoever my lot may be. Where thou goest, I will follow. Yea, my Lord, by thy grace. Do you see it now? Not in my strength, nor your strength. By thy grace, what now? I will follow thee. That's devotion. You push back, you grab your hymnal, you start singing those songs. And I love this one all the way, if you don't finish it. All the way, my, uh, that's devotion, my friends. And when you leave your, your prayer closet, you feel and have strength in Jesus. And all you're doing now is awaiting the glory of God to be poured out. And you will become a fit vessel because you don't know when it's going to be poured out. Just prepare your heart. How often? Daily, my friends. And you cannot be mingling with the daughters. You must be found as virgins, not committing fornication with the apostate Babylonian churches. So what must you now say, friends? How will you now respond to God? Come on down to verse 26. Verse 26 is another part of the prayer. And once you pray this with the understanding, you can become recipients to receive the glory of God. Verse 26 says, a time is going to come when there will be no rain. But if you pray this prayer sincerely, God is going to send the rain. I want to ask you a question. What is the, who is the rain a symbol of in the Bible? It is the Holy Spirit. And when the Bible says the earth will be lightened with his glory, who is going to fill us? The Spirit of the Holy Spirit of God, my friends. Look at verse 26. It says, when the he- where am I? Verse 26. When the heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, yet, yet, yet. If they pray toward this place, and what now? And confess thy name, thy name, and turn from their sin, and turn from their sin. Verse 27, let's all read now. Then do what now? Then hear thou from heaven, and what? And forgive the sin of thy servants, 
and of thy people Israel when thou hast taught them the good way. Pause right there. So what is the promise in those two verses? What's the promise, friends? What's the promise, friends? What will he send upon us, my friends? The rain. Former rain and latter rain. But is there a condition to receive it? Oh, what is that condition, my friends? If we want, if we confess our sins and turn from it. When you pray this prayer, with the understanding also, all you're saying, Lord, when you're ready, you send the glory. Just prepare me daily. What do you say, my friends? And the rain will come. Oh, beloved, <laughs> we must expect the rain daily. What do you say, my friends? This is the rain. In a practical sense, this is how we prepare ourselves for the latter rain. The glory of God because many are preaching the latter rain message only as some abstract theory. And you know I love the quote from volume 4, page 235. Two, that our religion will be of little worth to our fellow men if it is only theoretical and not what? Practical, my friends. Come over here with me. Second Chronicles chapter 6, skip on down to verse 28. Is there anyone here going through dearth? Is there anyone lacking here with tangible things? Anyone here going through sickness? I have something for you here. I have a slice of bread from heaven's bakery. Amen. And if you pray this prayer with the understanding also, guess what? The glory of God is coming. The benefits of God is coming. Glory, benefits. The blessings of God is coming, friends. Look at verse 28. It says, if there be what in the land? Now remember now, pause. Remember now, they were to pray towards Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, right? But notice now, after Christ came to the earth and said on the cross when he expired, it is finished. That means the work on the earth is what? Finished. Where is Christ now? In the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So where are we now to direct our prayers? That, that temple. Not some earthly building. You know, friends, I was doing some missionary work one day and I said to a group of young men, let's pray now. And the person actually took out this compass and he want to find which way east was because he wants to pray towards Jerusalem. Is there any temple over there? And even if they try to rebuild a temple, where must, which temple must we pray to? You get the point. Come to verse 28. It says, if there be dearth in the land, if there be what? Pestilence. If there be what? Blasting or mildew or locusts. What do locusts eat? Green shrubs. So here you are planting and the locusts and insects come and eat that thing. How do you feel? How many of you have lost your job? Your hours have been cut, been laid off. Your business, your job is not turning over as you would like to. This is your prayer. How many are going through and exp experiencing pestilences, sicknesses? It says mildew, locusts, or caterpillars. If their enemies beseech them in the cities of their land, whatsoever what now? Talk to me. Sore or whatsoever what? Sickness there be. Then what prayer? Or what supplication so ever shall be made of any man or of all the people Israel when every man shall know his own sore or his own what my friends grief if they turn and pray what's in verse 30 then do what hear from we're heaven thy dwelling place and forgive them and render unto every man according unto all his ways Will you be a recipient of God's glory, of God's blessings, of God's healing, of God's uh, temporal provisions? But notice verse 28 about dearth, desolation, losing your job, temporal uh, degradation and emptiness, sickness. This verse did not proceed. Verse 14 is as you surrender along the way. 
Then in your prayers now, you can say, no, Lord, I come to my temporal needs. You missed that. Many times when people pray, they jump to, oh, Lord, I'm sick. Oh, Lord, uh, you know, I've been laid off. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. When God is saying, I want your heart. Because if you die without a job and you die without me, you die lost. But if you die in me without a job, you die saved. <laughs> That's it. And many of us are like the thief on the cross who was lost. That thief who was lost, he, all, up, all on his mind was, take me down. I'm feeling too much pain. I'm going through too much grief. Take me down. But the other thief said what? Lord, remember me. Lord, meaning I'm surrendering. Remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom today. Based on this confession, when I come, you're going to be there. You're going to be there, my friends. So the question is, what is foremost in our minds? Skip on down with me. That was verse 31. Skip on down with me to verse 32. Moreover, concerning whom? That means if you were not born a Jew, can a stranger also claim the same promises? Is this food for your soul? Come on down. I won't read that. That's verse 32 and verse 33. Note this now. Verse 34 through verse 36, it's talking about evangelism. As you're going to do evangelism, God is saying, if you pray this prayer with understanding, he says, you shall see the glory of God, the miraculous blessings of God as you seek to win souls. Come on down with me now to verse number 40. Now, verse 40 now is very beautiful because verse 40 through verse 42 is the last part of the prayer. Is the what, my friends? Now, you must focus now because in this next chapter, chapter 7, verse 1, that is where you see Solomon ending his prayer and what came down and filled the temple. The glory of God filled that temple. So let's focus on the last part of the prayer. Do you know what it says? The last thing Solomon said was this. Lord, come on now. Enter into the place of your rest. So Solomon was saying, Lord, I have done the physical work. Now I want your presence in this building. Now, what must be our prayer now? Lord, I have surrendered. Lord, you called me. Now I have come. I have confessed my sins. You have declared me just. By faith, now come and feel me. Will you make that your prayer, my friends? Look at verse 40. Now, my God, let I beseech thee, thine eyes be open, and let thine ears be attent unto the prayer that is made weird. Verse 41. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, and come weird into thy resting place. Thou and the what? And the ark of thy strength. Mercy. Let thy priest, O Lord God, be clothed with what? Salvation. And let thy saints rejoice in goodness. Look at verse 42. O Lord God, turn not away the face of thine anointed. Turn not away the face of thine anointed. Remember the what, my friends? Go back to verse 31. So where must we ask God to come in? So can we not pause and say, Lord, come into my heart? You're having devotion now. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in when? Today. How long? How long? Because I'm praying, come in, I pray. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And when we pray this prayer, we are preparing ourselves to receive what? They are pouring off the latter rain, the glory of God. Now come back to verse 41. Do you see right here any instruction there? What is Solomon praying? Thou come into thy resting place, thou, you, and the what? And the ark of thy strength. So what has God promised to bring into this building? The ark of his? Okay, so what is God promising he will give to us? Who wants God's strength? So must you pray it? So since it's a promise, when must we believe it? 
So how would you respond to God? Help me to believe this promise. You will bring in your strength if I ask you to come in. If I give you the invitation, if I welcome you in, you'll come and bring what? Strength. Isaiah 45, verse 24. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness. In the Lord have I strength. Isaiah 45, 24. Will you say it, my friends? Come on down here. Then it says now, let thy, is Solomon still praying, my friends? Let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with what? Wait a minute now. What is God saying here? Who are the priests today? <laughs> dear God, let the preacher start preaching. Present truth, please, dear God. That's an external application. Let's come internally now. So who are the priests now? That must be clothed with salvation if this was your devotional reading. How would you personalize this? We are the kingdom of priests. You are a chosen, a royal, a peculiar. You get the point. So what must you pray now that God may do for you that day? Clothe me with what? And when he prayed that, what happened in the next verse? of chapter 7. The glory of God did what, my friends? So what must we expect? Are we seeing this, my friends? Come on down. What's the last phrase in verse 41? And let thy whom? And let thy saints do what? Rejoice in goodness. This is how the man closed his prayer. So he went in, maybe sorrowful and burdened, but how did he exit the prayer closet? So how must you exit your prayer time with God? Let thy servant, who are the saints now? Let us rejoice now. Rejoice in goodness. We're having devotion, my friends. What do you say? May I give you a scripture? Hold your place in 2 Chronicles 7. Go to Acts 7. 2 Chronicles 7, hold your place there. Go to Acts 7. Where are we going to, my friends? Go to Acts 7. Look at this now. Lord God, come in. Come in. Is there another hymnal song, a song from the hymnal that you would have sung, read, which says, come into my heart? Come in, Lord. Hmm, come in. Any, any, any other song? Come in. Hmm. Come thou fount of how many blessings? Every blessing. What must you do? Fill my heart with what? Streams of? Never call for, of what, my friends? Loudest praise. I want, I want this phrase. Prone to wonder. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my overtaken. Oh, <laughs> Are we going to have a song service here? Come to Acts 7. Look at verse 47. It says, watch carefully, verse 47. But whom? Now, now, I don't want anyone to miss this. This is the last ser sermon from Stephen. And he said, Solomon built a temple and God's glory filled that temple. But what temple did you build him? Look at verse 47. But Solomon did what? Built God a, a house. Verse 48. How be it? The Most High dwells not in temples made with hands. As said the prophet, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What is the next two questions? But what house will you build me? And so many times we preach the sanctuary, but it's just theory. What house have you built? What house will you build? Since God is asking us a question, if this was your devotional reading, how would you respond? Lord, today, my mind, my body is your temple, is your tabernacle. And praise God, this temple everybody can build. And you don't need to get harem, harem, to come with gold and trees and fir trees to come build a literal building we don't need cement no gravel amen nor steel 
What do we need? A willing heart. Next question. What house will you build me? Or what is the what? Or what is the place of my rent? And what did Solomon say? Look, come, arise, O God, into where? Th thy resting place. Do you see it now? That literal sanctuary, an object lesson for us personally. If it's clear now, say amen. But look at the caveat. Verse 51, what did Stephen say in the last sermon, last prayer? Oh, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. If that was your devotional reading, how would you then respond so God can come into your heart, your mind, fill you with his glory? Lord, what would you say now? Give me a heart that is circumcised. Which means to cut off the fat of sin. What else? Lord, help me not to be stiff-necked. Help me not to resist. Resist one. Resist your calling. Go back. Let's close. Second Chronicles chapter 7 now. Look at verse 1. Can I touch this? I will. Verse 1. Second Chronicles 7. It says, Now when Solomon hmm, had made an end of praying, what happened next? Watch this. So he prayed. Then what happened? Fire came down. Then came what thirdly? You must see this. He prayed. Then came what? Fire and then what? The glory of God. Why did the fire fall? And what did the fire do? Come on. The fire consumed the what? The burnt offering and the sacrifices. And then the glory of God came. Hear me now. The fire that descended after Solomon prayed, the fire came and consumed the offerings. The fire was a sign that the prayer was accepted. Just as who in the Old Testament? At the beginning. At the beginning. Cain and Abel. When Abel brought his sacrifice of the lamb and the blood and the fat, what came down? I can't give you all of this. Past, I can't give you all of this. This is patriarchs and prophets, page 71, blue words from top. And the Lord had respect unto whom? Abel and to his offering. What happened next? Red words. Fire flashed from heaven. And what, my friends? And consumed the sacrifice. Now hold your place. So once we surrender and the prayer is uh, with the right understanding, what must we accept now? What must we expect, rather? What must we expect? Not literal fire, but what? God showing us that he has accepted our life. Accepted our prayer. Make your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Accept me, Lord. Give me that fire. All right. Come back here. Verse 1. And then what? The glory of the Lord. Did what, my friends? Filled the house. Now pause right here. Hold your place in 2 Chronicles ch chapter 7. Hold your place there. Go to Matthew chapter 3 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Friends, I want everybody to keep their eyes by faith on Jesus. On whom, my friends? Because, notice now, I'm going to show you the potency of such prayer like Solomon. Do you know when Christ was baptized, do you know the Father also sent fire upon Jesus? It wouldn't be strange unless you go back to see what the fire typified. Consuming the offerings and sacrifice. What did the fire typify? Acceptance. So when Christ was baptized, in the Jordan, how did Christ receive fire? How? In what means? What was said? As the antitype of the fire. This is my beloved son in whom I am. Well, please. Did he receive fire? And did he receive glory? Look at this, friends. Watch this. Friends, when I read this, I just said, Lord, you're so good. Desire of ages, page 112, watch carefully. First sentence, never before have the angels listened to what? 
such a prayer. Many of us say, I want the latter rain. I want to be filled with God's glory. But we don't have a consistent prayer life. Without a consistent prayer life, you're not going to be saved. Solomon prayed. Even Moses prayed. Um, Abel prayed. Fire came. Glory. Christ, prayer, brought the fire, brought the glory. Get back to my screen. They are eager to bear to their loved commander a message of assurance and comfort. But no, the father himself will answer the petition of his son. Let's read now. Direct from the throne issued the beams of what? So what did Christ receive at the baptism? Glory. What was he doing before the glory came? Prayer. Watch. The heavens are opened and upon the Savior's head descends a dove-like form of purest. Of purest. Light. Next sentence. The people stood silently, gazing upon Christ. His form was bathed in what? Again in what? In the light that ever surrounds the throne of God. His upturned face was glorified. Was Christ filled with the glory of the Father? Was he filled with that light? But what was he found doing? This is my beloved son. At the bottom. This is my beloved son in whom I am well. That's the fire. John the Baptist had been deeply moved as he saw whom? Jesus. Bowed as a... What does that mean? Suppliant. Prayer. Bowed as a suppliant, pleading with tears. How was he praying? Tears. And how was he praying in Gethsemane? With tears. And what did he receive in Gethsemane from heaven? Tears. Power, strength. And what did he receive right here? Oh, my friends. John had been deeply moved as he saw Jesus bowed as a suppliant, pleading with tears for the what? That's the fire. The approval of the fire as the glory of God did what around Christ? Look at the application now. Application. Page 113. And the word that was spoken to, to Christ at the Jordan. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Let's read. Embraces humanity. Why? Because God the Father spoke to Jesus as our what? And what did Christ receive at the Jordan? Light, glory, approval because he was what? Praying. What can we also receive? Light, glory, and what? Approval. But what is the condition? What is the condition? And what did Christ experience from John the Baptist? Baptism. So what must we also receive? How will you respond to God right now, friends? It says, the glory that rested, glory, upon Christ is a what? What's the pledge? Promise of the love of God for us. Watch this now. It tells us of the what? <laughs> Do you have a consistent prayer life? Does your prayer life really make sense? Hmm. It tells us of the power of prayer, how the human voice, picture Solomon's prayer now, how the human voice may reach the air of God and our petitions find acceptance in literal Jerusalem in the Middle East? No, where must we pray to now? In the court of heaven? Last sentence, blue words. The light which fell from the open portals upon the head of our Savior will what? Oh, beloved. Will fall upon us. What is the condition? As, oh my friends, as we pray for what? For help to resist temptation. Go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Where are we going to, my friends? 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Look at what this says now. I close right here. In Second Chronicles 7. Friends, do you believe, do you believe these words? Yes. So tomorrow, will you have a stronger prayer life? Yes. 
a more meaningful devotion now, scene by scene. Oh, friends, do you know how long we have been praying for the glory of God to fill this church? And it starts with having personal, a personal strong prayer life, consistent prayer life. In 2 Chronicles 7, I'm going to go to the mark of the beast now. Ready for this, friends? Ready for this now? You sure? Look at this. 2 Chronicles 7. So verse 1, the glory of God did what? Fill the house. Look at verse 2. Verse 2. And the priest, let's read, and the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord. Why? Because the glory of the Lord had what? Filled the Lord's house. Talk with me. Talk to me. Where was this house that God's glory filled? So much so the priest couldn't go in to minister. Where was this temple? It's Solomon's temple. Will this be fulfilled in heaven? Go to Revelation 15. Where are we going to, friends? Go there with me. Chapter 15. I'm going there. Mark of the beast. Go there now. Chapter 15. Look at verse 7. Are we there, friends? Verse 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels. What now? Come on, what? Seven golden vials full of what? The underscore wrath of God. Full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. Verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from what? From the glory of God and from his power and and no man was able to enter into that temple till one, the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So will this find its antitype? The glory of God fill the temple and no man can enter it. Why, which man can enter now? Jesus. And when he no longer goes in, it's because what has closed? Probation. And what is now being poured out? The seven last plagues. Verse 7 calls it the wrath of God. What text come to mind now? Wrath of God. Mark of the beast. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead, in his right hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the, finish it, wrath of God. That means the mark of the beast crisis is connected to the temple of God being so filled. Probation closes and the plagues are being poured out. Is the mark of the beast near? So what must we be filled with before that temple is filled? What a connection. What must we be filled with before the heavenly sanctuary is filled and Christ no longer goes in. Close probation, the seven last plagues are poured out. What must we be filled with? Glory of God. And what's the first step? Now, now wait a minute. Let me make sure nobody missed this. With what must we pray? With what must we pray? With what must we pray? The prayer of faith is what saves. And faith cometh by. Hearing by. That's how you pray. Scene by scene. You put yourself in that scene. Come here, friends. Let me see something. Let me see something. Look at this right here. This is, this is August 30th. People are calling on President Trump to shut down his evangelical advisory board. Why? Because the world is seeing, is seeing and seeing that President Trump is allowing churchmen to dictate policies from the White House to unite church and state. It's right there, head, headline. AU tells the Trump administration shut down evangelical advisory board until it follows the law. Red words. This, who is talking here? This is now a man by the name of 
Moore, Moore, Johnny Moore, Johnny Moore, blue words. And according to Johnny Moore, who is Johnny Moore? The spokesman for the advisory board. He says, it has a pretty, this board of churchmen, a pretty significant hand in what? Directing or affecting administration policy. Write down great controversy. Page 444, GC 444. And GC 445, we are here, my friends. Watch this. Moore has identified, quote, a long list of progress. The advisory board of evangelicals has made with the administration on what things? Watch. On policy, on personal decisions, particularly affecting religious liberty. Who else? Judges. Can you see what's happening here? Hmm. Who, by the way, is Johnny Moore? He is what? The spokesperson for Trump's evangelical advisory board. You don't see him here in this picture, but here he is on the left shoulder of Trump. What is he all about, by the way? He's the one who is saying, red words, Johnny Moore asked Pope Francis for a meeting of Catholic and evangelical leaders to take place how? Quickly. In, it's in this moment of ongoing persecution, political division, and global conflict that we have. Also witness efforts to divide. <laughs> we don't want that division, he says. Blue words. Must I give you the blue words right here? Uh-huh, I'll give it to you. Last sentence. Moore said he reached out to Pope Francis because of the Pope's Reputation as a what? Bridge builder. Wait a minute now. So who is reaching out to clasp whose hand? Protestants clasping the hand of the papacy. That's great controversy page. Page 588. 588. When you see this, she says, a Sunday law is near. All right. You could read that. Won't spend much time there. Red words in the middle. It says, same Johnny Moore. In efforts... Yes, in efforts, that's it, yes, in efforts to mend the wounds, mend what? To mend the wounds of the evangelical Catholic relationship, Johnny Moore has, has requested a what? And who is Johnny Moore? The spokesperson for the evangelical advisory board to President Trump. No wonder you see how Trump is now defending the Pope. Come on down here. Blue words, last sentence, Johnny Moore, when evangelicals and Catholics work together, great things happen. Yeah, that's true. And based on prophecy, what great thing will happen? Persecution. What is uh, steaming and boiling on the, uh, the media pot and the media stove? What's bubbling in Congress right now? The confirmation hearing of Brett Kavanaugh. All right. Do you know why this is significant? Because Sister White says, in order for America to speak as a dragon, a nation speaks through two of her branches. How many do we have? We have three branches. What are they? Legislative, that's Congress. Executive, that's the White House, and judicial, that's SCOTUS, Supreme Court. And how does a nation speak? Through her legislative and judicial, Congress and Supreme Court. This must grab our attention. And she says, watch what's happening in Congress and the Supreme Court, the first sentence. Let's get to Brett Kavanaugh now. Watch this, pass that. Look at this. At the hearing, September 6, 2018, when Kavanaugh took on the task of explaining the meaning of the Establishment Clause. When he was speaking this week, the phrase separation of church and state was notably absent. And he mentioned two cases. Why? Blue words. Kavanaugh used these two cases to make the point, watch this, that some religious traditions in governmental practices are rooted sufficiently in history and tradition. So now the Supreme Court 
can uphold those traditions? I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. What, brother? He's setting precedents already. Oh, he's setting precedents already. I want to ask you a question. Is, uh, are, are the Sunday blue laws riveted in American history? Yes. Sunday blue laws. Yes. All right. Come back here. Second thing. He says now, watch carefully. He says, in a friend of the court brief, Kavanaugh, submitted to the Supreme Court. Listen to what he put to, to the Supreme Court. He made a similar argument suggesting that the court should adopt this test to permit what? School-sponsored prayer at graduations and the beginning of the school day. So what is Kavanaugh pushing? He wants the Supreme Court to interpret the U.S. Constitution and then declare that we can put prayer back into school. Do you know why this is important? Because it was the Supreme Court that, that outlawed prayer from schools. And where is Kavanaugh trying to go and sit on which bench? To get there, to do what now? To reverse the 1962 law. Here it is right here, my friends. In 1962, the Supreme Court struck down the prayer in school, in public schools, because what? Then if you put prayer back into school, and when the Supreme Court did it, they said, we don't even want non-denominational prayer. Why? You open a door. Because then it becomes denominational. And now you're making the school the church. Can you imagine? So you send Johnny to school, but really, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you are sending Johnny to church. So when Johnny wants to get baptized, who baptizes him? The civil leaders. All right, friends. And this is what our pioneers saw. A.T. Jones, the same thing. Prayer in, into school, that is church and state union. Come back here now. They're saying to stop calamities, school shootings. They say pray, blue words, prayer is needed. It's what? Red words. We have to have the what? We have to have the spiritual side that made America great. What is Trump's, what was and still is Trump's slogan? Make America great again. Well, now the evangelicals are saying, we need a spiritual side to that. And what is that? To bring what? Prayer back into school, blue words. We are asking other spiritual leaders to join us in our attempt to go forward and remove that law. Red words. We believe that the solution, the answer is what? Prayer in our schools. Listen what Sister White says. This brought chills to my body. Blue words, bottom. Philadelphia and other important places should be worked. Evangelists should be finding their way into where? All the places where, where what, friends? Where the minds of men are agitated over what? The question of Sunday legislation and of the teaching, the teaching of religion in the public schools. And then she says, it is the neglect of Seventh-day Adventists to improve these providential opportunities to present what? The truth that burdens my heart and keeps me awake night after night. So when we see this issue surrounding Brett Kavanaugh, it must awaken us to evangelize, friends. Past that. Come back here. Come back here. Look at this. This is Diane Feinstein. And she was literally drilling Brett Kavanaugh. September 6th, blue words. Dan Feinstein noted that Brett Kavanaugh, red words, was the point person of George Walker Bush's faith-based initiative. You have to wake up here, friends. So Brett Kavanaugh was the one, the point person, the spearhead man for George Bush's what? Faith-based initiative, which says what? That means you can take government funds to now support church organizations. What is that? And do you know what Brett Kavanaugh said? 
He said, I believe the Constitution supports taking public funds to support church organizations. Who will you believe? Brett Kavanaugh, who is interpreting the Constitution, saying it's okay to use taxpayer money to fund churches? Or will you believe the one who fathered and authored the Constitution, comma, Bill of Rights, who said, Madison, who said, James Madison, who said, you cannot use taxpayer money, civil government money, to fund church organizations? Who will you believe? James Madison, who wrote the document and told you it cannot support this movement, taxpayer money, to fund church organizations? Or will you believe Brett Kavanaugh? Who will you believe? Last sentence. Instead, blue words, instead, Brett Kavanaugh claimed that the, con this, is, this is September 6th. Brett Kavanaugh said that he believes the Constitution may require what? The government to fund religious programs. Here's James Madison who says it cannot be done. Red words, cannot be done, past that. And what is Trump pushing? Allowing, allowing, watch carefully, government funding for faith-based organizations. All right, notice now, Supreme Court rules that states can fund churches with financial aid. And the world said, the world said, bottom section, the world said, SCOTUS reduced the wall of separation between church and state Monday when it says, oh, states cannot refuse all monetary aid to churches. The world can see and discern. Adventists, most of us can only see, but we lack discernment. Lack discernment. That was one president, former Madison. Let's come to a second witness in a man called John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Listen to what he says. Two lines. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute blue words following where no church or church school is granted any public funds. So what does Trump stand for? A removal of church and states. That separation. Brett Kavanaugh, likewise. Unite church and state. Come here now. Pass that. And Trump has moved the faith-based group into the White House. Pass that. Now, friends, doing, oh, I need volume. Pardon me, preacher. We got volume there? I'm going to close right here. One video. It's about a minute. This is a video from a person by the name of Rick Warren. Rick Warren, purpose-driven life, purpose-driven church, etc. Right? Saddleback church on the West Coast there. Okay, come over here now. When George Walker Bush launched the faith-based initiative, when government money can support church entities, on the church side, it was Rick Warren that was championing this move. Obama came afterward and strengthened the faith-based initiative. Now we have Trump doing the very same thing, three presidents. So this is not partisan. It's not Republican. Or, no, 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 no. It's prophetic. Church and state confederacy. Watch. In this clip, you're going to see now Rick Warren. Does anyone know who Melinda Gates is? Who is she? Bill Gates' wife. Okay. And all the leaders of nations who are saying, we want the government to use churches as the places to distribute services. Think about that. If the government is using churches to distribute services, then will one day come where the churches say now, we got these from the, from the government, but as the churches, if you don't subscribe to our tenets of faith, our dogmas, our policies, our teachings, when that means you cannot receive these services. Is that day coming? 
Are we one step closer? And this is, is, is in the kernel and the crux of the faith-based initiative. Government using churches to distribute services. Verse, we can't buy or sell except we receive the mark of the beast and we worship the image of the beast. Watch carefully. Look at this. Rick Warren. There you have uh, Obama pushing the same faith-based initiative that Brett Kavanaugh was the what now? The point person. Look at this now. Ready? I'm lost. I'll end with this story. Uh, in last December, I was asked by President Bush to be the closing speaker at the Global Summit on Malaria. And I said, I want to just show you why we cannot eliminate malaria, much less any other problem, without houses of worship. Let me just show you one example. And so I said, I'll show you three slides. And I put up the first PowerPoint slide, and it was a slide of Western Rwanda. And I said, there are 700,000 people in this province. Here are the three hospitals, and I pointed them out on the map. Only three hospitals for 700,000 people. It's a two days walk to any hospital. That means if you get sick, you've got to walk over mountains for two days. Two of those hospitals are faith-based, and one of them is secular. It's government-based. So you need to have two-thirds of that without uh, you know, faith. And then I said, let me show you this. And I showed them the 18 uh, clinics in the Western province. And I said, it's still a day's walk to any of these clinics. And some of those clinics means I've just got a bottle of aspirin on the shelf. That's it. 16 of those clinics were faith-based, actually church-based, and two of them were government-based. Then I said, watch this. And I threw up a map with dots all over the map, dot, 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 everywhere. I said, here are the 726 churches in this province. If you're sick, let's say you have AIDS, where would you like to get your ARVs? After it was over, Melinda Gates came up to me, she says, I get it, Rick. Houses of worship are the distribution center for all we need to do. And that's what we need to partner on. Thank you. So if the government makes the churches the distribution center, then the churches become the image of the business form now. And what did they tell you? Were you not the one preaching against this system? Now, it may start off affecting those who are Paupers. Who are paupers? Those, it's, it's, it's more than poor. Those who depend on government assistance. And this goes back to the days of Joseph and Pharaoh. We have nothing more, Pharaoh. Here's our bodies. Take it for food. Paupers. And that's why as a church, we have to put things in place to get people out of Pauperism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you allow this, then it's going to grow and extend. And then they will say now, if you don't go along with our agenda, whatever service, it may be to cross a toll, whatever service, you cannot because of your belief system. We are here, friends. And this is what Brett Kavanaugh spearheaded on the two presidents before us. And George Bush had two terms, right? Obama had two, that, that's what, 16 years ago. And here he is now, under Trump. If he's confirmed or not confirmed, the point here, the issues were brought to prominence. It's time to wake up, friends. Pray with me. Is God about to close that sanctuary? Is the wrath about to be poured out? Is that temple about to be filled with smoke? What must we be filled with? So does this call for us to be self-sufficient? Self-sustaining? Self-supporting? That we don't depend on the government working through churches as the tentacles of, of octopus. <laughs> And if you don't go along with this agenda, your support will be cut off. Are you ready for this, friends?